so we've been looking at uh, free vibration and we looked at the cases when the, there is damping and when there is no damping. And for free vibration, remember what we said, the motion has to be initiated, meaning there is the initiation, the initial condition. So what happened in this case is that we assumed either, and I give an example of, uh, of a simple pendulum, a simple oscillator, and then we say for the motion to initiate, even if we are talking about the free vibration, then we have to have set, for example, like a displacement, initial displacement. Otherwise, that if there is no initial condition to initiate our motion, then uh, it's difficult to say how the motion initiates. But what we are saying is for us to call it free vibration, we are saying that if, for example, this is a pendulum, once we have this initial displacement, once we release this uh, pendulum, then we are not going during the motion. When now we start analyzing our motion, we are not going to uh, add or to impute additional force. So the continuity of motion is is uh, not uh, subjected to external force. So that's why we said from the fundamental equation of motion. Remember, this is very important. M acceleration plus uh, uh, CU, this is the dynamic, this is the damping part, CV plus KU, don't mind my writing, I'm using a mouse, is equals to F, T, yeah? So we said for free vibration, this component is equals to zero. Now, for forced vibration, now our motion, for our motion to continue, that is even after initiating our motion. Now the continuity of our motion is subjected to externally applied load or force. And that's why we are saying, this is just a representation of dynamic system where we have the mass and then we have the damping uh, part this is represented by C, damping coefficient constant. And then uh, the spring, which is the stiffness of the system. So we are saying the motion will be uh, subjected to a forcing function or externally applied load. How is this about? Let's see a practical situation. We may have a beam in a building, let's consider it as a factory. And then this is just one span of a beam, simply supported. This could be on roller support. Then we may have a machine resting on the slab. So let's just consider on a span of a beam. So this machine, is uh, is uh, it have got a motor so there is some rotary motion and maybe the way it's placed on this uh slab ball beam so it, it let's assume there is unevenness of the service such that there is some motion the machine itself of course when we are designing the ideal scenario would be when the machine is resting on this slab and there is no uh undesired motion because of the the machine but if it's out of out of balance let's say like the rotation or the balance the surface is not even then there will be because of the uh, the rotation of the machine we may have the vibration effect on this beam being contributed by what you are saying a forcing function there is a motion of the machine up and down remember i'm saying in ideal scenario but in real life we, we, we can't have another uh, scenario whereby the machine itself, as it rests on the beam, that's no motion of cars. So as long as this machine is running, okay, then there might be some motion, that, that some forcing function that is uh, that will impute some vibration on the beam, okay? So the forcing function or the value of F can be of two forms. It can occur as harmonic excitation. Harmonic, remember we talked of uh, harmonic function, is when the motion occurs in a repeated regular intervals of time. Okay, And if this motion can be expressed as a sinusoidal function, then we say it's harmonic. So note, harmonic is when the motion can be expressed as a sinusoidal function. But a repeating motion, even if it's not expressed as a sinusoidal function, we, we talk of it as being periodic. So periodic, repeating in equal intervals of time. 
So and uh, here, let's let's first forget about this expression because this is just expression I'm saying. If the motion and for example, the case I've given of a machine resting on a beam, it's very easy because the motion is occurring uniformly. You may find like you may find it very easy to have, or it's quite possible to have this motion being described as a sinusoidal function. The other cases of forcing function is when now you have non-harmonic excitation. So non-harmonic excitation, one, we can have like step loading. Like that is the exciting force is a constant. So it's not varying. It's a constant value, P naught. So the force variation with the time T remains constant. The other type of non-harmonic excitation is what we call ramped step loading. That is, initially the force increases up to a certain point in time, T is equal to T naught. From that point, the force remains constant. And the final case that we can consider of non-harmonic uh, non excitation is where we have general loading. Okay. So for this kind of uh, cases, for example, this one, you see we can have an, an empirical equation, empirical representation. What we had previously was analytical expression. Like this one, we can derive this equation from uh, first principle, basic principle, but mathematical principles. So analytical function can be used to describe this motion. Here, we may have either an analytical or an empirical. From experience, we can be able to express uh, the variation of force with time. For example, here, saying Ft is equal to P0 is constant. In this second case, we are having Ft is equal to P0. So it's increasing as a gradient t of a t node up to between zero and t node. Past t node, then the value of the f, the force f remains constant. Now you may have a general case, for example, earthquake or impact loading, whereby we do not have an, an empirical or an analytical way of uh, expression which can be able to describe our motion. So you are going to see this case in a later uh, in our later presentations, but let's first look at where our motion can be described using a harmonic function. So we are talking about harmonic excitation. That is, our system, our structural system, is being excited harmonically, and then we narrow down to when the motion is undamped. So what now that means? So this is uh, the dynamic representation here. And now on this part, we have now the free body diagram. The free body diagram now shows all the forces, internal and external, acting on the body. So let, let me just uh, briefly, there's some noise in the background. Let me just go there and tell them to quieten down. Just a minute. All right, sorry for that, guys. Uh, somebody was worshiping behind me, so I had to make them uh, pause. All right, thank you. So, you're talking about the free body diagram showing the forces. This is due to stiffness of the system. Uh, of course, now we have there's no damping, so the value, the damping coefficient here is no longer uh, uh, of consideration of concern to us. And then the inertia force, remember that the Albert's principle. And now we have the externally applied force. So you can see these forces are acting opposite to the externally applied force. So and the fundamental equation of motion now reduces to this. So what, what you should note here is that the value CV, CV or C, uh, the derivative of U is removed. So this part now, we say the externally applied force is harmonic and this is the force the harmonic force being applied the external excitation has got uh, an excitation amplitude of f naught and a frequency 
of this forcing function of omega cap. Okay, so remember the other one we were talking about the small omega, uh, the lower case omega. So for my case, so that you can note the difference, I'll be talking of ohm because I know you know about the ohm in uh, electric in electrical engineering. You have talked about the introduction to that part. So I'll be when I say ohm, I'm talking about the cap omega. All right. So now again, from your ODE, you can see. This kind of an equation is a second order differential equation. And the solution to this equation have got two parts. One, we have the complementary solution. And the complementary solution is when we consider the, this, uh, the right hand side to be equal to zero. So now because this becomes a homogeneous linear second order differential equation. So, and uh, that part, if this part we say it's zero, so the first part of the solution to our equation is of this form. And remember, this is equation number eight. We covered in the previous form, free and damped vibration. So this was the solution. So this is the first part of our motion. The second part is when now we, we do not equate this to zero. So for the full part, we have what you call the complementary, the particular solution. The first part was the complementary solution. The second part is the particular solution to the now. Because this part is no longer zero, the equation is no longer homogeneous, right? So I'm just mentioning those terms because I know from your ordinary differential equation course, you really dwelt into details about that. So now the equation for the non-homogeneous part, that is the equation to this now uh, equation, the solution to this equation, the whole of this now, considering this F naught sine omega t, sine ohm t, is as shown here, that mu p is equals to u sine ohm t, okay? So now you see we have two parts, the complementary and the particular solution. U, the cap U, is the amplitude of the forcing function. So if we substitute equation 46, this is the solution, into the equation 45, so to substitute that, Substitute that here. First, what we need to do is we have to differentiate twice to get uh, the acceleration so that now we can be able to substitute the particular solution into this, uh, the, our fundamental equation of motion. So once we do that, so this is why now we are substituting and we, co we cancel the common factor. The common factor here that you find in uh, through other equation is sine ohm, ohm t. So we are going to be left with this kind of an equation, equation 48, all you simplify to this format. So what you are going to have is uh, the amplitude of the forcing function, right? Remember our forcing function, the one I had talked about the machine, which is out of balance. So we are talking of the amplitude, okay? This one we are giving it capital U, okay? It's given by F naught, okay, this equation 49. So if you look at this part, F naught of a K is this is what we called the static deflection. F naught of a K. And don't forget where we derive this static deflection from because it's just from Hooke's rules. F is equals to K delta or K E. So we are just talking about what is this deflection? The static, not dynamic, the static. What is the erogation of the spring? Due to static, uh, due, to, due to the applied load, the static erogation. So this can be further be simplified by introducing a dimensionless ratio R, which is defined as the frequency ratio, and this is the ratio between the the frequency of the forcing function and the frequency of our motion. Okay. Remember, 
our motion the dynamic motion there is this part let me just go back slightly this part there is a motion here and our forcing function now is harmonic okay so there is the wave if you can present as a wave there is a wave of the forcing function and there is the sinusoidal wave of our motion on the left hand side so what we are talking about in this case is that the ratio of the two frequency of the forcing function and the of our motion is referred to as the frequency ratio and now the complete solution to equation 45 this fundamental equation of motion for harmonic excitation with uh, no damping is given by the combination of the complementary solution plus the particular solution and i have used the color notation so that you can see the difference so you just add this part this one we had derived before this is the equation that i brought for equation eight this is equation eight i said repeated and then what we have just derived in this slide this part so this is the complete solution to our equation or our motion for forced vibration with no damping Okay, this is just uh, a repetition here, equation 51. Now, of course, this uh, constant A and B, the constant of integration, which are obtained from the initial condition. So, uh, when uh, at time t is equals to zero, if you assume that uh, at t is equals to zero, this is U note. I'd recorrect in your slide. This is U naught. The initial displacement is equal to zero, and the initial velocity is equal to zero. This is an assumption we are making. Then the constant of integration will be, if you substitute in this equation, you'll have A is equal to zero, and B is as shown here. So therefore, equation 51 becomes, if you substitute A is equal to zero, this part will collapse. Okay? Sorry, this part will collapse, and you'll be left with this 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 part here let me just delete this so of course the a part will be zero you'll be left with this and then if you combine this way we have now the combination of the signs together the sign sign terms you're going to have the equation 52. so what we are talking about now in this equation equation 51 this part r sign omega t we call it this transient response and this will vanish out due to damping. Okay, let's hold this. Let's hold our thoughts here. This one, you are going to see what we are talking about. You see, now this component, of course, this is a common factor here. This component, which, remember this part, we say transient. We have the uh, frequency due to our motion, the free vibration motion. Now, this part represents the motion due to the forcing forcing function and this is what we call the steady state response why steady state remember our motion we have external applied force a forcing function so our motion continues so this is the one that will persist this is the part that will persist because of the external applied force we call it the steady state response so when omega or when ohm is equals to omega or when uh, the frequency of the forcing function coincides with the frequency of the motion that is the value of r this parameter that we defined here the value of r sorry my screen keeps on flickering the frequency ratio is equals to one When the frequency ratio is equal to one, then resonance occurs, and the amplitude approaches infinity, or is almost equal to infinity. So what we are saying, when the two frequency of the forcing function and the frequency of the system is equal to one, so this one will be one minus r is equal to one. So you see this component, the denominator is equal to zero. Of course, when you divide any number by zero, this value, the value becomes infinite. Okay. So that's why we are saying 
resonance will occur. All right. Now let's see when there is damping. Remember we have said, let's just hold our thought in this part. Let's see the, when damping, when there is damping. So when there is damping with forced vibration, now we reintroduce this component, the damping component. And now from our free body diagram, we have the component CV or C, the derivative of U, okay? The viscous damping coefficient uh, component. Now, our equation of motion now, we reintroduce back this term, C, V. And now, again, the solution will have two parts. And if you remember, if we equate this equals to zero, remember the complementary part. The first part of our solution is when we equate the forcing function. We assume the forcing function is equal to zero. So remember now, this one corresponds or the similar to the equation of motion for free vibration with the damping. And the solution to that was given by equation 36. So the complementary part is as given here when f is equal to zero, this component is equal to zero. And again, now the particular solution is when now we consider the whole equation. So this is the typical form of the particular solution. So we add two part now, the sine ohm t and the cos ohm t. So if now you substitute equation 54 and 55, which are the solution, this is the solution to this equation 53. If you substitute this to 53, and remember for you to substitute, it means you have to differentiate twice, once to get uh, u dot or the velocity and twice to get the acceleration. Once you do that, you differentiate and then you substitute to this equation and you equate coefficient of sine and cosine because what you shall be having, you shall be having the terms, the cos terms and the sine terms. So if you equate those, because what we are trying to do is to get the coefficient of integration, the C1s and the C2. So you equate the coefficient of sine and cosine to obtain the, the constant C1 and C2 as follows. So C1 and C2 will be given by equation 56. So note that uh, by just looking at these uh, equations and this working, they are very simple because uh, PowerPoint, yeah? you can see it's just worked out. But you need, really need to work them out because, for example, if you are doing a, an assessment, you are being assessed, you cannot, just, you cannot just mention, you cannot just put a blanket statement the way I have put in this part. You need, we need to see the working. We need to see how you derive this. So you need to see those differentiation. We need to see you differentiating this up twice, once and twice, and substituting this equation, and show you are working to come up with these values. Now again, we employ Euler's relationship. The Euler's relationship I've given in the previous slide. These ones they are the ones which relate the exponent like for example e minus i i x can be expressed the Euler's relation enables us to express this in terms of the trigonometry so it's a switch between trigonometry and the exponent with imaginary numbers okay and this one i said in your smp you can find this expression so this my fact this is cos x plus i sine x so when this is positive uh when this is negative the sign will change okay so can you confirm from uh or i can even confirm from you because i had given it in the previous slide let me tell you which equation was that we had the euras expression given in slide number because i'm hoping you have all the notes so it's good to refer to the previous notes all right i'm just i'm just moving scrolling backward to where i had given you the euros expression yes on slide number 35 below equation 31 that's where we had the the euros relationship i had given there in bracket so kindly refer that to your notes 
it's very clear there. So we are saying when this is negative, of course, this sign will be negative here, not positive. So this, the advantage of using neural relations is because we can be able to move or to shift between uh, the imaginary numbers to trigonometric functions. And now using that expression, our equation of motion, this equation of motion, equation 53, now instead of using the trigonometry function sign, we can use an exponent and an imaginary number. Okay. Again, you should note that only the imaginary part of this forcing function is acting or will bring about motion. Why? If you can recall, in our previous uh, uh, slide in a uh, study, like again, I can take you back there, quickly go to your note. When we are talking about free vibration of damped, a, a, a damped motion, free vibration of damped single degree of freedom system. We talked of three cases whereby we can have critically damped system of a damped system and at a damped system. And we said for critically damped and of a damped system, no oscillatory motion occurs. And for that case, we ignore those motion. And we said our system, we are going to consider oscillation of vibration when it's at a damped. At other damped, we had from equation 31 in your note we had uh, the expression under the radical being negative so we had an imaginary part because of that imaginary part that's when we said uh the motion the oscillatory motion will be uh realized so this is the same case we are mentioning here that uh, only the imaginary part of the forcing function is acting or will be able to produce the oscillatory motion okay therefore the solution the particular solution remember now this is the same case we are talking about here the particular solution up remember the particular solution in our case is very important because this is the case when we are considering the forcing function the complementary part is when the forcing function is equated to zero so the particular solution is the one that considers the forcing function. All right. Now, so the particular solution now, and if you only consider the imaginary part, we say it will be of this form, equation 58. Now, you substitute this solution, equation 58, into equation 57. So again, you have to differentiate twice to get uh, the acceleration and once to get the velocity and then you substitute the, the, the your answers into this uh, our problem or your uh, your solution the solution here to our problem of uh, equation of motion and you cancel the common factor remember in the previous slide the common factor was the sign uh, the sinusoidal part uh, i mean the trigonometric part now again in this equation because we are using the exponent the common factor when you work out you find this a common factor which you can cancel so that you are going to be left with c as given by this equation and the particular solution the up will be given by this expression because you have already calculated what is c so this is substituting c into uh, equation 58 so i hope you are together after that part so these ones are just working so the, you you have to have a, a hard on experience you have to really work this equation out for you to get these answers and to understand to eternalize in your system yeah? otherwise if you just look at the mathematics and the calculations they they might look easy uh but the, the, when you you are told to work them out when you don't have this example then uh you find like you are stuck somewhere so please work them out so in polar coordinates again this is from your algebra. You talked about the polar coordinates and the rectangular coordinates. So you can express our equation 60 can be expressed in terms of theta, the angle theta, theta being our first angle in this form, where theta or tan theta is as given by equation 52. So the response now, the UP, 
considering or uh, substituting theta is as given by equation 63 or you can simplify by introducing now the amplitude of the steady state motion which is the whole of this part this is the amplitude okay you see this is a sinusoidal function so any part which is uh before the the sine term or the cos term is the amplitude of the motion with the capital u so this is the the response the steady state response the steady state response of our motion and this is the amplitude of the steady state motion okay so we are saying this is the forcing function This is the forcing function. Don't confuse this one. The forcing function, if there's a machine, we said the amplitude is F naught. Okay. Now, because of this forcing function, our structural system is going to have a motion. And the resultant motion will have an amplitude. And the amplitude of the resultant motion is the one that is defined by this equation 64 and this is the what we are calling the capital u right so now i hope you are okay you're still together at 100 good so remember i said i'm using full screen so if you have a question just raise your hand you just go to your profile you click status then you can raise your hand. All right. So we have seen the uh, the response of steady state motion, and we can express now. Let, I can at this stage I can go back to where I say let's hold our houses here. This is the part we said the steady state motion, the one that incorporates the motion due to incorporating the forcing function. This is the motion for the free vibration, okay? And then this, we say the transient. Transient is something that is temporal, that is pa passing by. Mm? Steady state, meaning this is a co the continue, the one that makes our motion to remain uh, or to be continuous. That's where the term steady state motion comes from. Now we can uh, write rewrite our equations 63 we can write our equations 63 64 60. all these equations you can write them in dimension rates dimensionless constant or ratios as follows remember we defined the some ratios we already defined the frequency ratio which other ratio did we define okay we defined the damping ratio as c of a C critical, the frequency ratio as ohm of omega, and also we define the static diffraction, UST, as we defined the static diffraction as f naught over k yeah okay this this is this might not be this is not dimensionless but using these ratios we are saying we can be able to simplify our equations 63 64 and 65 into this form 66 67 and 68 so the total response of our motion, 53, as we said, is a combination of the complementary part and the particular part. So the complementary part is as given here. The complementary part, the one we talked about it being transient. And then this is the particular part, incorporating the forcing function. Now, this is why I was saying about, I was talking about the transient, or our motion have to add. You see, this part, the exponent this is an exponential decay 
If you remember our equation of motion with the damping, we had something like this. Okay? And we had a line that I had drawn like that, which representing represented the decay of our motion, of the amplitude. The amplitude continue decaying, reducing. And this curve, the exponential decay was expressed by E negative psi omega t. So you see, this part we call it transient because you see, it, as the motion continues, it's going to dampen out, it's going to dampen out and finally vanish. That's why we talked of the transient part, the part when there is, we don't consider the forcing function. If there is no forcing function, our motion is going to stop. Because even though initially we talked about the free and damped motion, in real structures, in actual scenario, real world, we must have damping. Damping is must be experienced. So our motion will come to stop at one point. At the only part, this that will continue uh, making, uh, ensuring that we have uh, vibration or motion continuing is because of the forcing part. And this is the part we talked of, the UP, the steady state motion, part, uh, the steady state response due to the forcing function. So you now I hope now you understand where, where I had said the transient function is going to uh, the transient portion is going to vanish. And we have seen mathematically the expression or why or how this vanishes because we have the exponential decay coming into, into play. Right? So I hope now that is clear. The portion between the transient and the steady state response. So now I know now you already you already know or you can already you've already appreciated that the most important part for forced vibration uh, damp system is the part the steady state response part and remember we said we talked about resonance so resonance will occur when the motion so this is when we are considering the external applied force or the external excitation so we have to go and then we, we evaluate the frequency of the forcing function and the frequency of our system and we see how the two frequencies compare resonance will occur if the two frequencies are the same or equal to unity their ratio right so when resonance occurs at resonance, we say the frequency ratio R, which is equal to ohm, or the forcing function frequency of uh, the frequency of our system, structure system. If it equals to one, then damping will occur. And when damping occur, it means the amplitude becomes infinity. That's why you see the plotting of my curve here. The, the ratio when this now this this is a curve or this graph shows the relationship between there is a part here I want to introduce the dynamic magnification factor but let me just mention about the frequency ratio and the damping ratio so at the damping ratio very small values of the damping ratio that's when you are going and the frequency ratio is equal to one that's when usually the resonance occurs so the amplitude is very high and this can be catastrophic to our structure because we are saying the amplitude of the motion the resultant motion if the forcing function if the frequency of the forcing function coincides with the frequency of the motion the natural frequency of our structure system if they coincide then we experience what you call catastrophic catastrophic failure of our structure because the amplitude is very large and you see even though we may say the amplitude is very large our materials are limited the material that used for construction you still use concrete tiba they cannot accept you know amplitude is about deflection they cannot take in that quite large uh, amplitude of our motion or deflection of our motion so remember the machine that we are talking placed on a beam if the vibration 
of that machine coincides with the vibration of our motion, that is the structure system, the beam or the slab. If they coincide, then the amplitude is very high. The deflection will become too large, such that the structure will fail catastrophically. Right? So now I introduce another term, dynamic magnification factor, which is the ratio of the steady state amplitude, which is U, over the static deflection, UST. I remember UST is equal to F naught over K. And this is given by equation 70. And this is a component given here. So at resonance, at resonance R is equal to 1. So this one cor uh, collapses to 0. And this is 1. So we can take the square root of that. So we, are, we have the dynamic magnification factor is equal to 1 over 2 xi. Okay. So at resonance, this part, the dynamic magnification factor is given by this component. So you can see the issue of um, why it's very important to to analyze what is the, the the forcing function, analyze its motion and also the frequency, so that we know whether it's detrimental to our structure. So let's see because we have been derived, we have derived a number of equations. Let's see how do we apply them in a real structure analysis. So in this example, so we are given a one bay, one story, still rigid frame. It have got hinged support. So hinged support meaning this is pinned, pin jointed. Okay. Pin jointed meaning uh, there is no restraint to rotation. So in actual scenario, if this hitch and this hitch, this structure cannot stand. Eh? But we have just considered one part. Yeah, if this pinned, the structure cannot stand till four. Okay. But this is a theoretical case, or maybe we have a, a number of bays. Okay, and then maybe this is fixed, and then this is hitched, maybe another one fixed. So we are considering only this part. Okay. So this one, this machine carries a rotating machine. So there is a rotating machine here on top at the gutter level, the gutter level, the beam level. And this machine, it provides a horizontal force at the gutter level in the form of, so this structure carries a machine, and this machine provides an external horizontal force in form of, expressed as 550,000 sine, 11t. So again, now you are told assume 4% critical damping. If you assume 4% critical damping, so what is the steady state amplitude of the vibration? Steady state amplitude is the capital U. And also, what is the maximum dynamic stress in the columns? Maximum dynamic stress in the column. So static stress, of course, is if we have a, a load which is resting static load, like a dead load, or a life load, like our machine is placed, but no motion. But now this this machine for it to reproduce a horizontal force, maybe this machine is reciprocating to and fro. Yeah? Consider this to be like in a factory. Yeah? Roiro, Mabati roaring means. There is a machine that is have got a piston inside it that is moving to and fro, to and fro, to and fro, horizontally. So that's why it's able to provide uh, a motion horizontal force in this form, okay, sinusoidal form. So let's see now what's the solution. You are given the I for the column, the Young's modulus, and the modulus, the section modulus. Sometimes you might not be given these parameters, especially this, the section modulus, and I, but you might be given the charts. I know, you, I hope you know from your design, from the steel design, which you conducted last semester, the I sections. Eh? I'm, I'm assuming you are given some charts. So in those charts, you can be able to obtain the section properties. Right? So you don't have to be necessarily given these parameters. Again, like for example, I, if I give you the dimension, if I give you the dimension, like I tell you what is the depth, if it's a rectangular section, like a rectangular hollow section, and I give you what is the depth, what is the breadth, you can be able to calculate these parameters. Eh? So 
this just as a, a highlight or a disclaimer because in an, an assessment although we do not necessarily study for uh for exams but note that that can happen so don't be flabbergasted or worried that you're not given those terms so first we need to calculate what is the stiffness of our system so in this case we have two columns remember from the introduction we said lumped mass the dynamic representation so we combine all the columns so that to have the combined the effective stiffness and now the mass the lumped mass here this from the introductory introductory lesson that we covered the first the first, very first lesson when we talked about moving from transitioning from the real from the actual from the real world so this this was on slide number number 12 when we move from the actual continuous structure we we in dynamic analysis then we model our system as discrete system and finally we want to model it as a dynamic system where we assume the mass to be concentrated at the nodes the flow levels and of course now the quorum we only provide the stiffness and we had to combine the stiffness of all the quorums for us to have the effective stiffness so with that so the first part is to calculate what is the stiffness for both quorums of course with this pin jointed and this uh, like a can't lever so you have the value k to be given by 3 ei of l cubed again i remember i gave you what are the in slide number i'm just taking you back so that you don't forget these these things because they are very important i gave this on slide number um, line number what the stiffness column stiffness column stiffness yes slide number 30 i was trying to give some spring constants so different uh, edge fixities and how how you can be able to calculate the equivalent stiffness or the the spring constant given the spring constant how you can be able to evaluate the stiffness all right so so far so good i hope we are together with the 110 people all right good so you calculate what is k and that value there i leave it as a gap for you are working out so the natural frequency will be given by this equation the root of k of m you have calculated k you have the mass the mass the steel garda have got this mass right not here one bay one steel rigid frame aha sorry in this write-up i should have although i have shown the sketch eh, i should have shown that this is the mass the mass of the gada the rigid gada is 5000 kilograms so this is not this part so again what you are given what is ohm what is omega this is the forcing function. Forcing function, we say this F naught sine ohm t. Okay. So with that, so F naught is equal to 50,000. Uh, ohm or capital omega is equal to 11. So this is equal to 11. Therefore, the frequency ratio is equal to 11 over what you have calculated here. Also, you have been given the damping ratio as, look here, assuming 4% critical damping. So the damping ratio is 0.04. They have earned the frequency, uh, the amplitude of the forcing function F naught is equal to 5,000. Therefore, the amplitude of the steady state vibration is given by this expression so you just need to plug in all those values you have calculated and you are going to get that parameter so now here i have caught you so you have to work this out to get these answers so the second part is on what is the maximum dynamic stress in the current 
because of that motion, what is the maximum dynamic stress? So if we are talking about the static stress, it means we do not consider the dynamic motion or the first vibration will be set to zero. So dynamic stress, so the maximum shear force in the column, shear force, shear force, remember, is force. Force is equal to stiffness times the total deflection, okay, or displacement. So now here, remember, the shear force, even when you are talking about the shear force, you consider this individual column, you are, you are going to, you, you plot it individually on each column. So the stiffness here, when we are talking about the, our dynamic system, we had combined the stiffness of both columns so that we have just one uh, represent the stiffness and the ramped mass here. But now when we come to the actual case, now we only need to calculate, we have to consider the stiffness of the column individually. So that's why we just, you see here now it's not combined as individual. So the shear force is this times what we have calculated as the steady state, the, the amplitude, the amplitude of the steady state motion or response. Now we have the shear force, the maximum bedding moment, uh, moment is equal to V max times, times L. Remember, it's like a country river beam, so we have the total L here, the length of that length is given us, our length is given as uh, where is that? Yeah, our length is given as four meters. So times the shear force, you get the, the maximum bedding moment. So it means with these two, you can be able to plot the shear force and the bedding moment diagram, all right? And therefore the maximum stress is given by this equation. Remember the equation of simple bedding, beam, beam bedding, we say, we say sigma f of y, y is equal to, m of i is equal to e over r okay so m over i this is the stress this is the distance to the extreme fiber this is the bedding moment uh moment of inertia modulus and radius of gyration so this is not necessary. So we consider we are using this part. And uh, we say it again. Uh, the stress is equal to, from this equation is M. So this one will be M Y over I, which can also be given by M over Z or S, which is the section capacity. So section capacity is given in the question, so you can be able to get the maximum stress, dynamic stress. All right. So I don't know whether there is any question so far with that example and the working. So are we together? Just want to Ensure that I'm still audible from your side. Mohammed 10021, are we together so far? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I have 114 guys. Yes, yes, okay, okay. So let's consider uh, consider another example. So we see how you apply. So what, what as I had explained from the previous presentation, eh? In this course, deriving deriving the equation of motion and understanding is, I think, is the part we can say is, is a bit um, involving. But application of this equation is very easy. So, can you uh, move through those uh, derivations so that you can see how we are we are we are working on? You know, again, we because 
uh, learning is about understanding the principles and the basics and the, uh, the basic principles and the concepts so I, I could just have given you the final equation to you to use but you may not know where they are coming from that's why you have to do the derivation for our understanding so let's see now another example we have a machine uh, with that mass is supported on a, a simply supported on a is mounted on a simply supported beam there is a piston inside the machine that produces a harmonic uh, force of this magnitude and frequency so if you neglect the weight of the beam so sometimes you assume the machine is very the, ma the mass or the weight of the machine is quite large so we can assume the weight of the beam is negligible again you assume 10 percent of the critical damping we are supposed to determine the amplitude of the motion of the machine the force transmitted to the beam support and the corresponding phase angle so the first part is easy the second part we have not covered explicitly what is the force transmitted to the beam support so to do this I have given some information here. So you have this beam simply supported, and then there is a machine here. And these are the parameters, the flexural rigidity of the beam. The parameters are given. And the machine have got a piston that is moving up and down, producing a certain motion. So for us to understand or to calculate what is the force being transmitted to this, we have to consider to go back to understanding uh, understand our motion our dynamic system representation so we see what component transmit the force to the foundation or support so this is a damped oscillator so you have a stiffness and the damper these are the ones that are connected to the support and the equation of motion of course is given by equation 53 i have repeated that equation here so for the damped oscillator here, the force transmitted to the support is through the spring and the damper. Therefore, the total force transmitted is due to the spring, stiffness, K times U, and the damper, the viscous damper. So that's equation 71. So for the steady state solution to the above motion, so our motion, is given by equation 53 and we found that the solution to this motion is as shown by equation 64 where we consider the steady state so we are considering the particular solution portion okay where the u this is the amplitude of the steady state response was given or we derived it as shown in equation 68 so you can see i've written repeated because this is an equation that we have already derived so this is uh, given by equation 68 and of course the theta tan theta is as shown where theta is a phase angle okay therefore now if you differentiate equation 64 and uh, substitute in equation 71 there is some this is remember you want to calculate the force the total force transmitted so you want to the solution here u and the velocity and you know the solution is this one up is equals to u as given so we are saying we substitute this solution to that equation of f so to do that we need to differentiate once so that we can be able to substitute in this equation here c v or u prime uh, u, u dot so when you do that, you substitute equation 61, uh, 71, you are going to have the total force as uh, shown here. So this just simplifying. And then now here they have introduced another angle, beta. And finally we have equation 73. So this just simplifying our expression. Where tan beta is equals to as uh, shown here. So sometimes we introduce this angle just to include more or simplification, but the angles here represent the phase, the phase shift. Okay. Remember, we said for our motion, if you go back to physics, 
So for example, if you have a motion like this, a motion starts like at that point. So this, this distance from the horizontal axis to the zero, this is the what we refer to as the phase angle. Okay. So if the motion now is starting at zero, of course the phase angle is equal to zero. And that's why you find like the equation of motion here, this might be sine, let's say omega t minus or plus alpha. This is just a hypothetical case. This is the phase angle, the shift from the origin, from the start of our motion. Okay. And phi, again, we combine these two angles, phi and uh, theta and beta, to use just one angle, phi, which is equal to theta minus beta. And therefore, tan theta becomes this. And theta, again, these are just the phase angle. Theta is our phase angle. The beta and the phi, or the phi, are just angles we are using to simplify our working. Okay. So now you see, we have been able to get what is the force and the term. So let's see further simplification. So from the equation 68 and 73, so working out those two equations, 68 and 73. So you have 73, the force F, you have 68, the, the U we can replace here. And working now the angles, the way we have simplified them, eliminating the trigonometry parts. For example, by using these expressions, tan beta and all this, tan theta. So you are going to add up. There is a lot of working here in between. So you should be able to work it out. You are going to be left out with the maximum force transmitted is equal to this value given by equation 77. And therefore now transmissibility is given as the ratio between the amplitude of the force transmitted to the support and the amplitude of the applied force. Therefore, TR is equals to FT over F naught, the amplitude of the applied force. So in this expression now, this F naught goes. So you are left with this part. So now remember the example that I gave example six. As an exercise, I have said using equation 71 to 78, find the solution to example six. Very easy. Okay, so now we have seen F. So now our question was, what is the amplitude of the motion of the machine? What is the force transmitted to the beam? And the corresponding phase angle. So the force, of course, FT, we have the expression. The amplitude, U, we have the expression. And the, phase, uh, the angle, theta, we get the tan inverse. So with this equation, you can comfortably calculate that. And uh, for your reference, in our main uh, text, in our main reference text, example 3.8, you can follow example 3.8. There is a worked example there. The only thing you need to replace is the values because it's a different example. I've changed the values. So you need to replace those values and you can be able to calculate what is what is uh, the amplitude, the phase angle, and the force transmitted to the foundation. So there are a number of there are many things we can do with, with these equations. These are just a typical example that I've given. Actually, in the other class, the other that I taught the last three years. 2016, I had not given them so many examples, but there are very good examples in that book that you can go through. You might not be able to tackle all of them, but just look at the different examples that we can be able to work out using these equations so that you appreciate why these equations are very powerful and important in the analysis of the motion for our structural system. So that marks the end of my presentation for today. Now I welcome, I open the floor to questions or clarifications. But the questions are not on deriving the equation because this equation, 
you have to work out. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with you. Kindly work out these things. I did this. Uh, there's an advantage of working, um, of uh, studying through, uh, giving students PowerPoint and slides. Eh? Because if you are in class, we could be solving this. We should, we could be calculating. But uh, for the slide now, uh, especially now that uh, I, I don't have a touch screen, uh, a computer, so working out this calculation may take, uh, it may not be very clear. But for your part, kindly work them out so that we can internalize them in your in your system, in your brain, eh? if I may say that. All right? And that's where you find the two examples. I have not completely given you the last answer so that at least you can uh, be motivated to go and work them out. All right. We have about...